Amen. From Holy Ghost, for the hearts that they one and kill on them the fire thy love, send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray, O God, let us instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant us by the gift of the same spirit that we may be truly wise. Never rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. O Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. St. Pius X, St. Isidore, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Right. Um, so today we're going to start the topic of holy orders, the next sacrament in line after having considered extreme unction. And next Tuesday there would be no Catholic doctrine class um, because it's Halloween and everybody's going to be trick or treating, right? So I mean, <laughs> so actually, uh, yeah. We're, so we're going to have the uh, party. The All Saints Day party here tomorrow, uh, next Tuesday in the evening. Uh, so the next catechism would be two weeks from today. All right, holy orders. Um, so I just want to kind of zoom out to start off and think about for us to think about the different conception of God that we have as Catholics um, as opposed to Protestants. So we um, we believe that there is this harmony between the natural orders and the supernatural order. That the way God has designed nature is um, instructive about the way he designed the supernatural order. That the way he designed nature is similar to the way he designed the supernatural order. Or the way he designed the supernatural order is, resembles the natural order. And that makes sense because we as human beings, we first of all live in the natural order. Um, so in other words, as, as humans, we live in this world and we, we interact with, with it. Uh, this, is, this is the world we're familiar with. And if he's going to say, I'm going to try to get you to the next world, I'm trying to, trying to try to get you to heaven, then, then the way he designs that path, you would expect him to make it familiar with us as, as well. I mean, to, to, to uh, make it like the natural order so that we can relate to it. So this is what God does. And what we find is that in the natural order, God loves to use instruments. He doesn't do everything himself. He loves to uh, communicate to his creatures the power to do things on their own. So he works through secondary causes, what we say. So he's like the first cause of all things. Being the first cause means you make things exist. You give them their natures. You make them be what they are. They they, they're not nothing, and they are this certain thing that he's made them to be. Whether it's human beings, or rabbits, or, or dogs, or cats, or plants, what, whatever. Um, and he has communicated to his creatures and uh, the power to, to do remarkable things. Um, you think about the, the plant world. Um, wherein the plants have the capacity to, to take in sunlight, to, to take in uh, moisture, and to, to grow, to, and to reproduce, produce other plants like unto themselves. Um, and then in the, in the animal world, even to have the power of self-movement, where the animals can uh, react to the environment around them, to, to know that environment to a certain degree, and uh, to move themselves to seek out their own food, and when we when we come to human beings, of course, we have an incredible incredible capacities that have been given to us by God. Where, whereas we we can know um, at, at a universal level, can form concepts, and we can also choose. We have free will, which animals do not have. And th this is this is an incredible um, power that, that God has communicated to us. Instrumental power that, that we're able to use our humanity. To, to make free choices. When we think about um, the power of, of marriage and the capacity to bring new life into the world and bring that new life to adulthood, just to consider one case of, of God wanting to work through instruments. Um, so just like in the, in the 
plant world and the animal world, God's, God's not like creating directly every single plant, right? He's not, he's not doing that at all. I mean, he had to start off the plants. He had to create the first plants. But from that point, he's not creating them. Um, they're reproducing. Um, so, so too in, in the animal world, the same thing happens. In the human world, um, husband and wife come together and God has given this creative power to provide the matter for the body of the child and then God infuses the, the soul, the immortal soul, into the child. And they bring this, this new life into the world. And God doesn't step in to raise the child, right? He, 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 doesn't, um, he, he doesn't say, okay, well, this is what must happen with this child's life. I'm going to make sure that it matures in the right way, that it learns what it's supposed to know. Um, no, he says to the parents, look, I've given you this power to bring new life into the world, and I, I want to work through you for the growth and maturation of this child to bring it to adulthood. Um, maybe this is on my mind because we, we were just at the Angelus Press Conference, myself, Father Fuel, and Father Fulton, and it was everybody was talking about the family um, and the responsibilities of parents and to, to raise their children and, and so on. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an incredible uh, task that, that God gives to parents. And my, what I'm trying to emphasize is that <clears throat> he wants to work through them. He wants to empower them to accomplish this great thing, which is the raising of their own children and the bringing of them to adulthood. He's not going to step in and say, I'm God, so I'm going to do it all myself. No, he's going to work through them. And we're talking about the communication of life. We're talking about um, the, the development of, of a child to the adult life, to where it's able to function and thrive as a human being. That's what happens in the natural order. And, and what we see is that God has something very similar happen in the supernatural order. Because that's what the priesthood is about. The, the priesthood is about God choosing not to give everybody graces directly. Like he's, he's just going to um, work directly on people like the Protestants imagine. Like they're going to read the scripture and he's just going to inspire them. He's just going to give them grace. Um, everything's going to just be a one-to-one -one relationship between them and, and him. That that's the way it's going to work. On the contrary, God wants to work through human instruments to confer grace. And this even happened in the, in the Old Testament. You can think about the people of Israel when they were enslaved by the Egyptians. And what does God do? God could have just wiped out the Egyptians and said to the people of Israel, now you're free. Um, but what does he do? He appears in a burning bush to a man, a shepherd, right? And says to him, I want you to go and deliver my people. And I'm going to work through you. And you're going to use this rod and throw it down. And it turns into a snake, you know, and he grabs it again. And like, and then he does, he shows him uh, a, another miracle where he puts his hand in, in his cloak, pulls it out and it's full of leprosy. And he puts it in again and he pulls it out and it's clean at, at, at that point, just to prove to Moses that he's going to work wonders through him. But it's by using Moses as the instrument. And then you have this great tale of, of, of Moses going to speak to Pharaoh, leading the people of Israel out into the desert, speaking to God, giving, giving to the people the, the laws of God and directing them as to what they're supposed to do. So this is what God does in the New Testament as well. He wants to communicate grace primarily through the ministrations of priests. He, he wants to make priests almost necessary for people's salvation. Um, because the communication of grace primarily happens through the sacraments. And the sacraments primarily happen through the priest. 
The Catechism says, It will readily be seen that the sacraments all depend on the sacrament of orders to such an extent that without it, some of them could not be constituted or administered at all, while others would be deprived of all their solemn ceremonies, as well as of a certain part of the religious respect and exterior honor according to them. So even if you could get baptized by anybody, right, but you can't have the ceremonies, the, sol the solemnization of baptism without the priest, where you have the administration of the holy oils, the exorcisms, the, 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 the blessed salt, and, and all that. Now, we have the transcript, basically, of a catechism lesson given by St. John Marie Vianney on the priesthood, on holy orders, on the sacrament of holy orders. And he talks about this very fact. He talks about this remarkable thing um, that, that we Catholics believe that God primarily wants to communicate grace, grace through the sacraments and that grace, the, the sacraments primarily work just through priests. But you need priests to confer sacraments, you need sacraments to get grace. That's, that's the way it works. And he has some beautiful words about the necessity of the priest. You probably are all familiar with a famous quote of St. John Vianney about what a place would be like if it didn't have a priest. Like if, you, if the priest goes away, then what happens? You remember, any of you know what he said? Yeah, that they would they, they would worship, they would be worshiping beasts after 20 years, pretty pretty much is what, what he says, yeah. Yeah, they would be idol worshipers after 20 years if, the, if they didn't have the priest. So, I'm just going to give you a long quote from, from his catechism lesson. He says, St. Bernard tells us that everything has come to us through Mary. We may also say that everything has come to us through the priest. Yes, all happiness, all graces, all heavenly gifts. If we had not the sacrament of orders, we should not have our Lord. Who placed him there in that tabernacle? It was the priest. Who was it that received your soul on its entrance into life? The priest. Who nourishes it to give it strength to make its pilgrimage? The priest. Who will prepare it to appear before God by washing that soul for the last time in the blood of Jesus Christ? The priest. Always the priest. And if that soul comes to the point of death, who will raise it up? Who will restore it to calmness and peace? Again, the priest. You cannot recall one single blessing from God without finding side by side with this recollection the image of the priest. Go to confession to the Blessed Virgin or to an angel. Will they absolve you? No. Will they give you the body and blood of our Lord? No. The Holy Virgin cannot make her divine son descend into the host. You might have 200 angels there but they could not absolve you. A priest, however simple he may be, can do it. He can say to you, go in peace, I pardon you. Oh, how great is a priest. The priest will not understand the greatness of his office till he is in heaven. If he understood it on earth, he would die not of fear, but of love. The other benefits of God would be of no avail to us without the priest. What would be the use of a house full of gold if you had nobody to open to you the door. The priest has the key of the heavenly treasures. It is he who opens the door. He is the steward of the good God, the distributor of his wealth. Without the priest, the death and passion of our Lord would be of no avail. Look at the heathens. What has it availed them that our Lord has died? Alas, they can have no share in the blessings of redemption while they have no priest to apply his blood to their souls. The priest is not a priest for himself. He does not give himself absolution. He does not administer the sacraments to himself. He is not for himself. He is for you. After God, the priest is everything. Leave a parish 20 years without priest. They will worship beasts. If the missionary father and I were to go away, you would say, what can we do in this church? There is no mass. Our Lord is no longer there. We might as well pray at home. When people wish to destroy religion, they begin by attacking the priest, because where there is no longer any priest, there is no sacrifice. And where there is no longer any sacrifice, there is no religion. When the bell calls you to church, if you were asked, where are you going? You might answer, 
I'm going to feed my soul. If someone were to ask you, pointing to the tabernacle, what is that golden door? That is our storehouse, where the true food of our souls is kept. Who has the key? Who lays in the provisions? Who makes ready the feast? And who serves the table? The priest. And what is the food? The precious body and blood of our Lord. O God, O God, how hast thou loved us? See the power of the priest. Out of a piece of bread, the word of a priest makes a God. It is more than creating the world. Someone said, does St. Philomena then obey the curia of ours? Indeed, she may well obey him since God obeys him. If I were to meet a priest and an angel, I should salute the priest before I salute the angel. The latter is the friend of God, but the priest holds God's place. St. Teresa kissed the ground where a priest had passed. When you see a priest, you should say, There is he who made me a child of God and opened heaven to me by holy baptism. He who purified me after I had sinned, who gives nourishment to my soul. At the side of a church tower, you may say, What is there in that place? The body of our Lord. Why is he there? Because a priest has been there and has said holy mass. So, um, the Curie of ours is just giving us a very deep insight into God's will to make so much of the supernatural order depend on the priest for good and for bad. And you could think about the decision of God. God's thinking about how am I going to design the supernatural order? And he says to himself, well, I'm going to have all these graces available to souls um, through my redemption. How am I going to get them to souls? I'm going to use human instruments. And someone will say, but, but Lord, that seems very dangerous because men are unreliable. If you use human instruments, they could fail. They could become corrupt. There could be a lot of problems. Can't you anticipate that priests, that they're going to be bad priests, that they're going to lead your people astray. There's going to be, a, like Martin Luther's out there, you know. There's, there's going to be uh, modern Jesuits and, and things. <laughs> um, you know, with the, all these prelates with, with, their, with their synods uh, trying to find every way possible to baptize the, um, the wisdom of the world, which is against you. But in spite of all these risks, these real risks, um, God decides to make the supernatural order depend so much on the priest. And this is, this is what made St. Pius X and Archbishop Lefebvre um, focus so much on the priesthood. When you read St. Pius X's first encyclical, A Supreme Apostolatus, and he's talking about that my program is going to be restore all things in Christ. And he addresses himself to the bishops. He tells the bishops, you make sure that you form good priests in your dioceses. And the, the, the priest, you priest, you must teach the faithful, the, the Catholic truths. Um, so it's, it's obviously in the, in the wisdom of God for that to happen. And when, when well, he, wa he wants to make... Um, the, the natural and the supernatural orders correspond to one another. He, he, he wants there, there to be some sort of representative um, that's, that's more immediate and direct that, that people uh, interact with. And if, if we want to know what happens when you remove that will of God and you say, no, we're not going to have any instruments, we're just going to go directly to God, then you, you look at the Protestant world. Um, first of all, there's, there's no unity, there's, there's total division. Um, and also, there's no sacramental system. Uh, you, you eliminate the sacramental system, especially the, the sacraments of confession and Holy Eucharist. The, the sacraments we receive most frequently through the hands of the priest do not exist in the, in the Protestant world. When the priest is good, uh, the faithful are good. Uh, when 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 they're, when they're a good priest, the, the, the grace is communicated to souls and things work out. When the priests are bad, it's it's really bad. It's really bad. Um, so God 
obviously understood that that that, that would be the case. Um, and it's really unfortunate we, you know, good good priests are, are hard to come by. To today, it's if we if we want to look out and say why is the the church collapsing, um, why is the practice of religion collapsing? Uh, it's it's because of the failure in the priesthood and the, and the hierarchy. Um, so it's just a it's something for us to reflect about. It's something for for me, obviously, <laughs> to reflect about. Is like um, bit of bit of pressure, bit of pressure there. <laughs> You're wondering why you pray for priests. You know, it's just like there's there's a there's a lot of responsibility on the shoulders of the priest, um, in so far as the way he behaves, the way he communicates the sacraments uh, will determine to a large degree whether the faithful uh, save their souls or do not save their souls. So by the design of God, just like with the parents, wh whether the children end up saving their souls or not saving their souls to a large degree depends on the, on the formation that's given to them by their parents. Um, God has willed there to be a natural connection between parents and children and for them to have a, an immense influence upon the children. <clears throat> and if the parents are good, that's great for the children. If the parents are bad, it's terrible for the children. You know? um, it, goes, it goes both ways. And the same is true with, with the priest. If the, if the priest is good and he is holy, then the, uh, the faithful profit greatly. If not, then the faithful suffer. They suffer terribly. Um, so we're just going to talk today <clears throat> about some of the requirements for candidates to orders, including and especially the candidate in the Western Rite um, the, the requirement in the Western Rite uh, for celibacy and why why we do that. Yes. I experience of not the thing to do with the priest of the society or priest of this Christ King. Um, but it's, it's, there's a clear division when they did monks. They speak the same, they teach the same. Yes. The catechism, the, the, um, do I feel like I belong to the same group as, I, as, as a Novus Ordo priest? Uh, for the same religion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends upon and the what, priest. What happens when a, a traditional priest meets another priest? It depends when, upon when the priest. About, when do they talk about that? I mean, I, I, I met a diocesan priest here last week. You know, he seems to be a very, very good man, um, trying to do the best he can. So it, it depends upon the priest. I think it's harder for the priest to live their priesthood in the novice order of environment, to, to live the authentic priesthood. As as established by our Lord, um, but not in some cases not totally impossible. Um, certainly, the the priests who are being faithful to their divine office uh, and uh, which unfortunately has been watered down, but the their, their vow of celibacy, who keep a rule, <clears throat> who try um, to say no, mass as devoutly as they can, or try to celebrate the TLM sometimes. Uh, would would have a, a much closer affiliation to someone like myself, um, but but yeah, the priest priesthood has been denatured to a large degree, and you you can talk to uh, some some of the priests, and there's Father Fulton has a lot of stories about the seminary life, you know, um, and you're just wondering what what are they thinking in their formation of of priests today. So let's. Talk about some of the, the uh, requirements for candidates to orders. Um, 
requirement requirements for someone being ordained a priest first of all holiness holiness there's a difference between the religious life and the priesthood and the and that the religious life you enter the religious life and, and hopefully we all know the distinction between the two where the priest is someone who is a cleric separated from the faithful ordained for the administration of the sacraments and the sanctification of the faithful so the priest is ordained for the people to sanctify them and to govern them to teach them to lead them to heaven that's why the priest is ordained the religious is someone who wants to seek the state of perfection wants to pursue the path of perfection as established by our lord right that where our lord says if thou wilt be perfect and he, he there's certain things that you have to do <clears throat> what are the main things you have to do if thou wilt be perfect Renounce yourself, take up your cross. What, what are the specific things that all religious do? And that is the three vows. They take, they take three vows. All religious take three vows, the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Where did those three vows came, come from? The gospel. The gospel. And they're called the evangelical uh, councils, the evangelical councils, evangelical, not because they come from the Bible Belt, you know, <laughs> evangelical because they come from the gospel. Evangelical councils, um, our Lord's invitation to embrace poverty, chastity, and obedience uh, in order to attain perfection. This is what you must do if you want to seek perfection. The surest way to save your soul is to become a religious and vow yourself to poverty, chastity, and obedience for life. And if you do that and you persevere in it, pretty much, you know, like St. Gregory the Great says, we don't need a canonization process. This person saved their soul. Pretty much guaranteed. You know, if, they're, if they're living the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience for their life. So someone would, would choose to enter the religious state because they want to be sure about the salvation of their soul they want to be holy they're saying what's my best option for being holy what's the best choice i can make for being holy and the answer is you become a religious you become a monk or you become a nun and you make the vows of poverty chastity and obedience you live those vows out if that's if if, you, if you, that's the main thing you're wanting to do is to, to save your soul and become holy then become a religious well for the religious when you enter into religion it's not required that you be holy i say okay well you want to become religious are you holy yet like no i'm not okay well go back home and get holy get holy first and then then come back and knock on the monastery door no the, the requirement is that you want to be holy that you have a desire to be holy, that your intention for entering the religious life is to attain holiness. That's a requirement. But the priest is different. The priest is supposed to be holy when he's ordained. So you have the, the seminary formation, and one of the things seminary formation is supposed to do is to make the candidate holy enough <laughs> to, be, to be a priest um, because the priest is ordained for others. The religious enters a religious state primarily to pursue perfection and attain holiness. But the priest is ordained for other people to sanctify them. And you can't give what you don't have. How is a priest going to be able to sanctify others if he is not holy himself? It's not going to work out. So that's the first requirement. The second is knowledge. Knowledge where, again, if 
Holiness is for sanctifying. Um, the faithful knowledge is for teaching the faithful so the three main duties of the priest sanctifying teaching and governing the faithful so now the, the priest has to have a deep understanding of the faith so that he can instruct the faithful and, and explain the mysteries of the faith to them so that he can hear confession, so that he can perform the rites of the church. He has to have a knowledge of the rites of the church, like how to perform the liturgy. Um, he, he has to have a knowledge of the, the the complexities of the of the moral realm so that when sins are being confessed to him he can then advise the soul or judge the gravity of the things that are being confessed and assess whether a person has uh, what is necessary to receive absolution then the third one is prudence Prudence is for the governing of the faithful. So the, um, the decisions that the priest makes, how he directs souls, how he administers his parish, uh, is depends upon his prudence. It, Hopefully, he's able to make good decisions um, about what, what's going to happen, what's going to happen in the parish, or souls come to him and say, Father, what should I do? Direct me. Tell me. Tell me what, what they do, what, what to do. And it's just something that struck me when I was first ordained. You know, and people would come to me. I'd never met them from Adam. They would sit down and they would just say, Father, um, you know, should I get this job? I'm like, I have no idea if you should get this job. I've never met you before. <laughs> I don't know your your history, your back history. You know, the, the, uh, I'm not an oracle. I mean, I don't, you know, like, do you want me to get the crystal ball out? I'm just like, okay. Yes. Go get the job, you know. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it's like, I have to make a, a an informed decision. If and and the scary thing is, <clears throat> what, what I realize is that a lot of times, whatever I say, they're going to go do, and and I'm going to be responsible for them doing that thing. Like Father, I followed your advice, and it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work out. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so, the, the priest is not an oracle. He's meant to use the virtue of prudence. In other words, to gather the information that he needs to reflect and then to use a supernatural perspective to give the best judgment that he can give. The fourth thing that's necessary is the divine call. The divine call. This is what the epistle to the Hebrews says, right? No one chooses himself for the priesthood, but only he who is called, like Aaron. So Moses and Aaron were chosen by God, and they were they then formed the Levitical tribe, the, the Levitical priesthood, um, or the not the ironic priesthood, but the Aaronic, Aaronic priesthood. <laughs> yeah, after Aaron, um, they they were they were chosen, set apart by God to be the leaders of the of the people in religious things. And it's not good when when you have these 
bishops going around just ordaining whoever. You know, someone calls up 1-800-IMPOSE-HANDS, and they're like, hey, I want to be a priest. Um, they're like, well, that'll be, you know, 500 bucks. You just come to this address on this day, and we'll ordain you a priest but without seeing that they're, that they're instructed. And so there's, there's some crazy stuff that goes on these days where <clears throat> priests are ordained without proper training, um, without the, the, the bishops uh, having assessed the, the candidate. And I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming some, there's some money passed around as well. It's not the way it's supposed to work. The, the, the decision as to whether uh, someone is ordained is meant to be left to superiors who know the candidate well. And that's why in the, in the ordination ceremony, um, the, the assistant priest, he, he, he stands up and um, the, bishop, the bishop asks the assistant priest, do you know this guy? And you, are, you, are you confident that he is good? Um, and that well, he he will be a good priest. He's he's competent to be a priest. And the assistant priest says yes. And then the bishop he asks the people, and and he it, it, he says, does anybody out there know of, of anything that would keep this man from being ordained a priest? But he says it in Latin, and so nobody understands what he's saying, <laughs> and so nobody ever comes forward. And that's why I got ordained a priest. So. <laughs> <laughs> Got lucky, you know, the people weren't looking at their booklets, looking on the English side. <laughs> the, the last and perhaps um, the most, well, probably not the most important, but really important <clears throat> is the right intention. The right intention. The one who's entering the seminary and choosing to pursue the priesthood must have a supernatural intention. Um, must be a, so there can be the natural and the supernatural intention. And, and the catechism says it must be supernatural. Natural is not good. So it's natural if, if he's doing it for um, fame, power, riches, uh, comfortable life. You know, if he says, I'll become a priest, I'll just cruise. Um, um, <laughs> It's kind of busy. <laughs> if he's doing it for a benefice, this was something of the past. The, the catechism mentions the benefices where you would get slotted into a certain parish that has a certain income. And you had all kinds of abuses where you would have priests who had like three different benefices or bishops who had three different benefices. And they never even been to those places. They're like collecting revenues from these places, but they never even visited them, not even taking care of these places. Um, so this is something that can happen even when there's no Vatican II. <laughs> I mean, there's still plenty of corruption and misuse of the priesthood in the history of the church before our own times. The, the worthy of intentions, of course, are the... Um, Salvation of souls and the promotion of the honor of God. That's what a seminarian should want to be ordained a priest for. It's like, I want to save souls. There's uh, Everybody's going to hell in a handbasket. It's like, Souls are falling into into hell like snowflakes. I I I want to become a priest and, and help more people save their souls. Or <clears throat> God is being so disrespected today. Yes. How do you distinguish in the beginning about instead of religious life, but 
I don't know. I guess that list seems like it also will apply to someone who would want to be religious like as well. Like all those points seem like the prudence or discernment or divine call. Like isn't that also that applicable to being religious like for that position? Well, the religious life is more a choice. Um, may seem counterintuitive because we, we call it a vocation, right? So definitely there is a call from God, but someone, um, it, it's, it's different when someone becomes a religious. What happens in the ceremony? They come forward and they say, I am vowing myself to poverty, chastity, and obedience. So they're saying, I want to present myself to take these vows. Um, they do have to have the approval of the superior, but it's it's not the it's not the same as when you're ordained a priest, where the assistant priest comes up and, and he calls you, um, you receive the calling of the church. Obviously, you need you need to be holiness, knowledge, prudence, um, but but you're not becoming a religious primarily for for those souls. You're primarily becoming a religious in order to sanctify yourself. Whereas the priest is ordained for the people to, to sanctify them. Um, so the, the church has to really assess his, his candidacy and, and call him. Um, there's, there's crossover for sure. There's definitely crossover. Um, but I'm tr I wanna emphasize the, the different nature of those vocations. Uh, whereas the priest is ordained for others, the person entering the religious life, the primary purpose is for their own sanctification and holiness. Of course, they're going to be living their religious life in different ways, but like the Carmelite, it's just going to be um, in their in their convent their whole life. Like Mrs. Laura, she said goodbye to her daughter. Uh, a few months ago, she went off to Carmel, and and you know, if 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 Marianne perseveres in the Carmel, she's just going to be in that building for the rest of her life, pretty much, right? Yeah. So the contemplative vocations, they don't they don't have as much need of prudence <laughs> as a, as a priest um, because they're not dealing with with people and making all those decisions or or for knowledge. Of course, it will help them to become holy, and they should have the virtue of prudence. Um, but it's not part of their office as such um, to to make use of those things. So, canon law specifies several things uh, that are necessary for the validity. Um, of the sacrament, the candidate has to be male. No women priests. No women priests. Um, our Lord became incarnate as a as a male, and the priesthood is a participation in the priesthood of Christ Himself. So Christ was male, and those who participate in his priesthood must be male. Um, but also, our Lord is spoken of as being the bridegroom, who is his spouse, the church. His spouse is the church. And so he espouses the church, and through this espousal, he, um, he, he, he embodies marriage. Um, he typifies marriage. And marriage becomes sacramental insofar as the couple is meant to realize in their union the, what was realized with the union of Christ and his church. Um, so Christ lays down his life for, for the church. So the, the church um, is represented by 
by the, the, the religious, you know, um, it would be really strange to have a woman priest marrying the church because the church is feminine. The, 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 a crisis is, is masculine, the church is feminine. So how could you have a woman priest marrying the church? It would be reverse. It would be a, a, a lesbian marriage, a same-sex marriage, you know. <laughs> yeah. So it, that's that's why the the priesthood has always been something uh, male by the choice of God, and God gets gets to choose these things. So the validity necessary for validity. Um, male, baptized, and the intention to receive the sacrament. And then for lyseity, For the sacrament to be licit, in other words, <clears throat> for it not to be sinful when it's done. If it's valid but not licit, then, then he's truly ordained, but it's sinful if it's not licit. So the, the, uh, for it to be licit, the candidate has to be in the state of grace. has to be confirmed um, has to have goodness of life he's not our nax murderer or anything you know <laughs> he didn't just get out of jail you know he's just like uh, dude man I just got off marijuana last week and <laughs> just in time for ordination <laughs> yeah that would not be good not a pot pothead yes if you have reformed your life if you um i mean it depends on the previous crimes if you committed if, they, if they've been serious crimes the church says no because it's too odious to know that okay this man is administering the sacraments uh you know was a mass murderer he he, he killed three people and is um if you uh if you read The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, uh, there's like this famous Italian uh, novel, one of the most famous novels, a very pious novel, very beautiful story. But one of the priests in there is, is uh, someone who committed a murder uh, in, his, in his early life. But it was, it was sort of mm. in, the, in the heat of a moment, in the, in, in the heat of an, an argument. And that was not seen as an obstacle to him getting ordained, and he turned up, I mean, in the story, at least, he's a, he's a very good priest. Um, but, yeah, there, there can be certain crimes that render the person too marred by his past to, to get ordained. Um, he has to be the canonical age. Today, I think that's 24, be at least 24. Requisite knowledge. He's been in the seminary. He's had a seminary formation. He, he, he knows philosophy. He knows theology. Reception of previous orders. So this is the old code of canon law. The minor orders and the other major orders, so that the uh, the four minor orders and then the subdiaconate and the diaconate are supposed to be received before you get ordained a priest. If you ordain a priest before you receive the minor orders or before you receive the diaconate, you're still a priest because the priesthood contains virtually those other orders. But you that's not the way it's supposed to be done. Um, Yes, yes. 
unless you're dispensed by the church. And then a canonical title. What that means is that you're inserted into some, uh, you, you belong to a diocese, you belong to a religious order, you belong to something when, when you're ordained. It's, it's not... Yeah, yeah. Uh, you belong to a monastery, uh, you, you, you belong to a diocese, you belong to a religious order. Like a widow, right? Widower? Yeah, you can be a widower. Mm -hmm. You can be a widower, yes. Yeah. Father uh, Father Fuel. Yeah. Um Yeah, there's plenty of examples of, of that. Even um someone it was case cases where the the husband and the wife agree to separate. And the, the the man pursues the priesthood, even that is permitted. What the Western right does not permit is for a man to remain married, or to, for a man to make use of his marriage as a priest. For him to be married and enter into the priesthood and continue to exercise the married life as a priest. Whereas the Eastern Rite does allow someone, you, 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 they, they do allow married priests, but you have to get married before your ordination. So I had contacts with the Maronites <clears throat> in Australia, and they're from Lebanon, um, and they allow a married priest. And what, what happens is the, uh, the person who's going to be a candidate for the seminary, he has to decide if I'm going to be a married priest and I'm going to be a celibate priest. And if he's going to be a married priest, he has to get married before he gets ordained. Yeah. Those, priests can never be bishops. Those priests can never be bishops. Those priests can never be bishops. Um, well, let's see. Um, the, it's my notes say that they cannot be married again. The wife dies, and the bishops cannot remain with their wives. A priest must leave his wife if he has consecrated a bishop. So there is um, uh, more requirements for that higher function in the church. Why is it required in the Latin church <clears throat> for a priest not to be married? Obviously, so he can dedicate himself exclusively to the service of God. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, He that is without a wife is solicitous for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please God. But he that is with a wife is solicitous for the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and he is divided. And my interaction with the Maronites in, in Australia was, was interesting because, um, you know, I, I've met married priests and non-married priests, and non-married priests was, was telling me the conflicts that arise, even among the priests, between the married and the unmarried, because the unmarried priests are always suspecting um, or tend to suspect the, the married priest of neglecting their ministry for the sake of their family or using their ministry for the benefit of their family um, or being too worried about the money that they make. Um, it's like, I've got to support my family. So I'm, I'm functioning as a priest and I, th that like, I really need this the salary in order to keep my, my family taken care of. A another thing that, that I think we, we instinctively realize if, if we thought about priests having wives is um, how in some that would definitely be an obstacle to, to them opening up. I mean, if you think, well, this man has a wife and, and, I'm going to talk to this man. I'm going to tell him about my life. 
and then he's going to go home. And his wife's going to know what happened to him during the day, right? I mean, she's she's going to want to know how did things go, what what went on, and and the priest is going to talk to his wife about about his day. Um, so it kind of makes it harder for for people to um, open themselves up to the priest uh, if the wife is there or the wife is seen as influencing him. He uh, yeah, will not seen, be seen to be as objective. I was uh, I was on my way to Rome earlier this year, flying from Denver to Munich, and I was sitting next to a woman who unfortunately uh, left the Catholic faith. She grew up in Germany, but then moved to the United States and uh, lived in Hawaii and married a Methodist and became Methodist. And I was trying to say to her, you know, it's like it's important that a priest be celibate so that he's totally dedicated to the faithful and um, the faithful aren't worried about his wife. And uh, she didn't seem to think that that was a big deal. She didn't seem to think that, that was a big deal. <laughs> so anyway, um, there's definitely... Very good reasons. Yeah, you're pursuing two vocations at the same time. The respect to inspire with the aura. I mean, until historically, once you're a priest, you're high, you have the status. You have a high status in society. Noble families in Europe, the last son will be free. That's how it works. So, by um, the last son, the, yeah. the last son would be the priest. The youngest son. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, the fact that a, a man can remain celibate. Uh huh. Puts him aside. Yes. Uh, that, would, that would diminish greatly Absolutely. the respect that he inspires. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, obviously, if a priest has given, it, it's more obvious that a priest has given his life for the priesthood if he doesn't take a wife and he doesn't raise a family um, and he's not tied to, to one place. Um, so it also has a huge effect with respect to the liturgy. Even in the Old Testament, the Levites were not supposed to have intercourse with their wives a certain period of time before they would perform the sacrifices, right? And this was a shadow of, of the New Testament where, um, you know, like one of the things Archbishop Lefebvre mentions in our statutes is that the, the, the Blessed Virgin Mary provides the priests the motives for his celibacy in the sense that who did God choose to be the one who brought God down on this earth? He chose an immaculate virgin. So he, he chose this celibate virgin, this pure virgin, uh, to be the vessel for God becoming incarnate on the earth. And if the priest is supposed to go to the altar and say the words of consecration and bring God down upon the earth, it's, it's very fitting and appropriate for him to have that same purity, um, like, like the Blessed Virgin. So there's, there, there's a reflection upon the sacredness of the Mass. If you have a married priest versus an unmarried priest, like if, if you have a celibate priest who's there, it's more fitting for him to be pronouncing the words of consecration because he'll be holding... <laughs> The, the pure flesh taken from the womb of the Virgin Mary, you know, um, and, and calling him down on the altar as our, as our Lady did when at the Annunciation. So there's a lot of good reasons there. And, uh, you know, FSSPX News just today was publishing an article about one of these crazy bishops at the Synod on Synodality and saying, like so many have said before him, especially the Protestants, 
that, um, yeah, we need married priests. So he, he was just reflecting on, oh, there's all these problems. He said when, when he was a bishop of Essen for 15 years, like he buried 300 priests and he only ordained like 15 priests. Like, okay, so what's the solution? Um, it's not to basically have the same priesthood as we had in the past, traditional formation, and actually see this, the priesthood as something supernatural instead of social work. He didn't say that. He said, well, we need to admit married priests. That, that, that's a solution. And obviously, that, that's not going to help anything. And he's looking at numbers. Looking at numbers. They're not seeing the priesthood as something supernatural. So this is the problem with the Protestants. Protestants said there, there is no difference between the priests and the faithful. It's intrinsically the same. The, 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 the priests and the faithful are on the same level. So it's wrong for priests to be celibate. Everybody needs to get married. And that's what these reformers did, like Luther and Zwingli and so on, the, who were ex-priests. They went and got, and got married. Um, because they're, according to them, the God does not set the priest apart and make him something different or give him a special power over supernatural things, over spiritual things. So there's no reason for him not to be to be married. Um, and that, that uh, unfortunately, I think these these modern prelates, they put the priests on the same level as the faithful. They don't wear the cassocks. Um, and they for them, there's no reason to be celibate anymore. It's counterintuitive, but being putting the priests on the same level as the faithful is dangerous for the priests. Uh, in the sense that this, I mean, parishes, modern parishes function more and more like a democracy. Everything is democratic, there are various councils, or very kinds of the faithful decide, I call them bishops now, and they can sometimes put a lot of pressure on the priest. Um, a few months ago, in, 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 in Versailles, a young priest killed himself because he. I think there was some pressure from the faithful on whatever subject I, I don't remember. Uh, but it wasn't, uh, he didn't get the support he was expecting from the bishop. Right. And so that was very uh, publicized in the Catholic, uh, French Catholic world. Yes. Uh, and that's not, not that unusual. And in a way, you should. Yeah, it's, it's not safe for the priest to be at the same level as the faithful. He needs to remain completely sacred so that there's yes. this, again, this, um, it's hard enough to be a priest, but if you start being buddies with your uh, yes. uh, faithful, it puts you at risk. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, is the um, Eastern Rite considered to be? Yes, the Eastern Rite is in communion with the Church. So there's, there's the Eastern Rite have, has had married priests for a long time. Um, Since the schism, the Great Schism? Uh, I think it was before that. I think it was before the Great Schism. But it's not really the so much the mindset of the Church. Um, it's, it's by exception, and there's just not a lot of them. Um, but it's, it's not the ideal by any means. Um, all right, we'll conclude with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Our Lady, help of Christians. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Welcome.